look up on Patrick's Hill. <laughs> Who would you take down? Uh, Who, uh, Who would yeah, you take no, down? OTB AM's Mount Rushmore. Yes, yes, yes. OTB AM's Mount Rushmore. We've had Mayo, Offaly, Cork, Wexford all in the books. Some have been shambolic and uh, been overturned. Some have just been shambolic and somehow still stand. But now it's the turn of Donegal and the debate on this one has been ablaze uh, online over the last few days. And we have a couple of people who are going to make uh, the calls on them. First up, off the balls, Enda Call. Good morning to you all. Uh, Enda? Adrian, how are you? All good. You've, um, you haven't managed to hold your nerve here, Enda, in a way like any good Donegal goalkeeper would have done. You've flip-flopped on your decisions. I've changed it about 10 times. And yeah. it's not even just been on that Shea and Boner decision. It's been on multiple decisions across the across the entire selection. Um, Tommy Rooney will tell you that my first selection looks nothing like my actual selection. So that's how hard I've thought about it. That's that's the way I'm thinking about it. Is there going to be a fifth uh, sculptor done on the, the mountain, which is just a question mark? Well, you see, we have plenty of hills. So, I mean, it doesn't have to be four. We can have, we can have more than one Mount Rushmore. No, it does need to be four, and we're going to absolutely hold you to that. And, uh, you've, um, I, I really hope that you can sell this one to our audience because the major debate, right, has been obviously there. There are others, but the major debate will be joined by Karen Cunningham of the Irish Daily Star, another Donegal native. Um, you should also outline to us if there are any sort of parochial, as can happen, it turns out already, uh, with these Mount Rushmore's parochial uh, biases from one or the other in relation to certain picks. But the biggest one has been around the battle between uh, Shea Given and Packy Bonner. Bonner in the uh, vernacular. Uh, one of the toughest calls, I would say, of any county, um, given arguably a better keeper, obviously, and after that you're into grey areas about iconism and, and popularity. So who are you going to go for and sell it to us? Well, you see, I've uh, I've split it up into categories to make it easier for myself. So I've made this decision based on, number one, achievement, number two, standard of that achievement, uh, number three, impact overall, and number four, esteem held in the county. So obviously, if you're looking at this from a standpoint of sport, Olympic medals, Olympic standard, that's the highest standard of sport you can get. So that's the standard, but not necessarily, that doesn't mean you'd, you'd have the same impact in the county or you're held, held to the same esteem. Uh, so my first selection for this one is Michael Murphy. GAA, Donegal's a GAA first county. So uh, Michael Murphy definitely is number one on that list. Yeah, the greatest, inarguably the greatest Donegal footballer of all time. It's the one name that's uh, come up across all these selections that we've seen come through. Well, you see, we, we saw Christy Ring and Nicky Rackard make it make the list for other counties in this so far. Michael Murphy will be Donegal's Nicky Rackard or Christy Ring in 100 years' time. People will talk about the mistake of Michael Murphy and how good he was. When, when Michael Murphy first started for Donegal, they had five Ulster titles and they had won All-Ireland, and he's still playing. They now have 10 Ulster titles and two All-Irelands, been to an All-Ireland final as well on top of that. He is an absolute mountain of a man. And I, I, what's interesting about this, and I actually thought when, I was, when we started this off, that when I made the list, people would assume that there'd be GAA bias, and Michael Murphy might actually be debated as whether he deserved to be there any more than some of the players from 1992 or even the 2012 squad. But really, everybody who replied to that message, to me firstly, and to Kieran as well, Michael Murphy was the first man on the list. Well, like it's inarguable. Absolutely, he, de he deserves to be there, no question. And I'd agree with you probably, first name on the list. It would have been very interesting, the conversation, had they not won in 2012. Would, would he make it if he didn't have an All-Ireland medal, for example? Um, it's a hard one to think. Um, I don't think, one way, one way you can look at it is that I don't think... I, uh, Donegal would have won the All-Ireland without Michael Murphy. So it, it's either would he have made the list if they didn't win the All-Ireland? I think he probably would still make that list because Donegal, for me, I, I hadn't been to Crow Park for a big Donegal match until uh, Michael Murphy came into that squad. And when you think about some of the players that were on that team, so you had like Carl Lacey, Eamon McGee, Neil McGee, Neil Gallagher, uh, Colin McFadden, there are so many players in that squad that have been in the Donegal squad for so long and were already stalwarts in this team. And Michael Murphy came in at the age of 21 and was the captain straight away. 
and mm. nobody questioned it at all because he had, he had built up such a reputation at under-21 level for bringing Donegal to an All-Ireland final that he was already the leader of that. The, the younger players in the squad, they're coming onto the senior team, but he, he also gained the respect of the, the senior players very, very quickly as well because he was such an animal when you look at him. And especially in 20, uh, 2011, first of all, he was kind of a little bit, he wasn't quite bulky enough. 2012, he was an absolute machine. Uh, in athletic form, he was, uh, his physique was perfect. He was strong. He was fast. He was agile. And of course, you can't take away from the fact that he scored the opening goal in the all Ireland final as well. That will go down in history as one of the best goals in Donegal's. Yeah, I like there, so. Let's not spend any more time talking about Michael Murphy because it's not really up for debate. But the only other question I'd have in relation to his inclusion is about 2012 and how much of that success was wrapped up with Michael Murphy and how much of it was wrapped up with Jim McGuinness. Right. So he wasn't going to be my my second selection. I was going to wait and hold on. But Jim McGuinness is actually my second man on Mount Rushmore as well. Right. Go on, explain yourself. So, obviously, Michael Murphy played a big role. He did, he absolutely did. Uh, it, but if you look, and again, I named some of those players. So, you have Carl Lacey, who was an all-star winner before Donegal got any good at football. Uh, you had Eamon McGee, Neil McGee, Frank McGlynn, Car- uh, I already named Carl Lacey, sorry, Colm Anthony McFadden, who was the top scorer in the, in the championship that year, Michael Murphy. So, when I was making out this list, I was like, was this down to Jim McGuinness or was this down to the exceptionally talented players that he had at, at his uh, disposal? I think it was down a lot. A lot of credit has to go to Jim McGuinness here because Donegal always had talented players. They always had players who could do that. Like I said, Carl Lacey had won an All-Star in 2007 when Donegal, they won the National League, but they weren't, they weren't, weren't going to win the All-Ireland Championship. They weren't even winning Ulsters. Uh, so... Donegal, Jim McGuinness was able to bring these players together and bring some discipline to the situation and actually tell these players they are good enough to go on, go on and do something. And he, most importantly, he came up with a game plan as well to help that team become an absolute unstoppable force. One of the other toughest calls around this, and we'll get to Packy Bonner and Shea Given, don't worry about it in just a minute. I think that, Andy, you've, you've backed out of making a tough call here because I think that... Um, I'm not sure about Jim McGuinness on this list. I, Brian McAniff hasn't come up in conversation just yet, and I'm sure Kieran Cunningham might make a play for him a bit later on. But he broke the mould in winning in 92, and it had obviously never been done before. He was a uh, guy who was player manager for Donegal's first ever uh, Ulster win as well. He won countless Railway Cups when Railway Cups were a thing. Um, like, Jim did the Jim Gavin thing, right, of winning it as a player and a manager. But in the anthology of Donegal greats and how the story of Donegal... GA is told. You can't, I don't believe, look past Brian McAniff. Ah, uh, I disagree with you, but go on, Enda. All right, well, the argument for Brian McAniff is a very valid one as well, because he is he's the godfather of Donegal GA. And I mentioned uh, Michael Murphy and Donegal before Michael Murphy and Donegal after Michael Murphy. Donegal had never won anything before Brian McAniff as a player and as a manager. So, of the one All-Ireland and five Ulster titles Donegal had before 2012, Brian McAniff was involved in every single one of them, be that as a player or a manager. He was, he's the only man I know that was on and off as a manager for 25 years in, in county football. I'm not sure. Somebody might have done it elsewhere that I might not know of. Five but different stints, he, I think, yeah. Yeah, so it was, it was, it was spread out across the... So he, he, was, he just had this amazing dedication to Donegal GAA. And players like Eamon McGee, Neil McGee, they credit uh, Brian McAniff for a lot of their career as well. So you have to give him... He he definitely has to be considered, but I think what Jim McGuinness did, and this is where my categories come in, the impact that he had on Mm. the overall sport of GAA makes makes Jim McGuinness... Trumps trumps Jim McGuinness ahead of uh, Brian McAniff because GAA as a whole, as a sport, has changed completely because of Jim McGuinness. Yeah, I'm with, I'm with you on that one. And uh, I think that it kind of goes along with what you're saying about uh, Michael Murphy being remembered as a legend in 100 years' time. McGuinness will be remembered uh, as a bigger legend than, than anybody else uh, in Donegal 
football, especially when it comes to management in 100 years down the line, with the exception of uh, Michael Murphy himself. So I think it's an arguable... Ah, uh, yeah, but we're, like, we're, not talking about, we're not talking about who changed the game. We're talking about who changed Donegal. And for me, Brian McIniff is that man. Kieran Cunningham is on the line. Kieran, I don't know how much of that conversation you've been picking up on. Where do you stand, Brian McIniff versus Jim McGuinness? Yeah, I, uh, I, I, the call dropped for a second, so I missed a little bit of it, but uh, I got the gist. Um, uh, I wouldn't have Jim McGuinness on it. No, if it's a choice between Jim McGuinness and Brian McGuinness, it's no contest. But um, you have to, you have to look. When you're doing something like this, you have to look at the history of the county and sport within the county. Donegal never won an Ulster title in 1972. That's how late it was. They never actually got to an Ulster final in 1963. So, so up till Jim McGuinness took over, they'd won five Ulster titles in their history. And Brian McGuinness was manager or playing manager for every single of those, one of those. He also won their first All-Ireland. And he also was a brilliant footballer. He was an All-Star as a player. And he also, funny enough as well, he also played League of Ireland soccer under an, uh, a suit them. Because the ban was on at the time, so he played for a couple of clubs under uh, under assumed names. Uh, Jim McGinnis never had that playing career. Like you mentioned, that he was an all out winner as a player, but he was a, he was an unused sub. He was a squad player. Like he was way down the list. He was a, a, still a teenager in 1992, <laughs> and his playing career was was unfulfilled to a fair extent. Like he he, he was really good at figures and. Um, but championship football, it never really worked for him. Like he never got an all-star nominee, let alone an all-star. So it couldn't, uh, I don't think anyone could say he was an, all, an outstanding footballer. And that breakthrough, like you have to look at where Ulster football was. Donegal were never poor. Like it was overstated how bad Donegal were before Jim McGuinness took over. Because in the noughties, the three best Ulster teams of all time were down in the 60s, Armand Tyrone in the noughties. The teams that kept beating Donegal in the noughties were Armand Tyrone. So Armand Tyrone started to dip. Like It was a perfect storm in a way when, when Jim McGuinness came in. He did improve dramatically. He had the right players coming on stream at the right time and at the right age profile. But it helped that the two big powers had dipped. And also, if you look at Michael Murphy, I think Michael Murphy has been, was the most significant figure. Michael Murphy effectively has been joint manager of Donegal for 10 years under Jim McGuinness, Rory Gallagher, and Declan Boner, that he has a huge say in what goes on. The players hang on his every word. He's been captain for 10 years, which is unprecedented. Like, in, uh, most counties, the captaincy changes every two or three years, and he's not captaincy in name only. He has a massive say in what happens. He even sponsors the Dub Donegal Club Championships. That's how pivotal a figure he is. And this is not down to, to downplay what Jim McGuinness has done, but I think mm. can, he, recency bias comes into play and I think even two for the last decade is too much. Like, Carl Lacey was football of the year as well. He actually had two all-stars before Jim McGuinness came in. Like, Carl Lacey's a strong claim. But Brian McGuinness and Martin McHugh, you can't forget Martin McHugh, how surprise hasn't been mentioned much in this. Martin McHugh was one of the best players in Ireland for a decade. For most of the 80s and the early 90s. He was football of the year in 1992. He won two all-stars, 83 and 92. For... For, much, for five years in the 80s, Donegal didn't win a championship game. But for much of that decade, he was still the leading scorer in the country. He was very prolific. Um, and he was also very similar to Peter Canavan in that he was a corner forward who also played centre forward. He was, if you look back at the clips now of those games, a lot of them don't stand up to close scrutiny mm. now. The players you thought were great, now you're looking at they look they were a bit crude in their style. But... He was a stylist. Like he wouldn't have been out of place in a Kerry jersey or a Down jersey or a Dublin jersey. Like, and those two, I think McHugh had a huge say in Tony Bowe's success under Brian McGuinness, and those two shouldn't be forgotten. I think it would be too much to both Murphy and McGuinness. I think you have to look at either McHugh or McGuinness in there as well. Yeah, but I think so. So just for clarity, people who are just joining us, uh, Enda is going to pick his four. Donegal and Russia are selections and then uh, at the end then Kieran's going to get the opportunity to swap one of those out and so far he's made the calls of Michael Murphy that I think is pretty much inarguable and then Jim McGuinness and then you still have the opportunity to do the right thing and get Jim off that before you get to your final four but like that'll ultimately be your call so let's see how we work through this you're not tempted you're not swayed by anything that you've heard so far to swap Jim out there uh, no, I don't think so. And I know Kieran, I, I take Kieran's points in the certain terms of there might be a little bit of recency bias but that recency bias is more of there is a certain generation, which is my generation, that the biggest sporting moment of their career came, or, or of not, not of their career, of their life came uh, 
under Jim McGuinness's reign. I had never been to a big match in Crow Park before Jim Jim McGuinness took over Donegal. Um, I, I the last game, the first game I was in in Crow Park was a game against Armagh, and then and an Ulster game. For some reason, Ulster was second place in Crow Park that year, and Donegal got destroyed. And I I, I just thought I was young enough at this stage, and I thought this is what being a Donegal supporter is all about. This is what it's like. And then to the first, I, I don't think we can downplay that Ulster title in 2011. That was the first Ulster title Donegal had won in over 20 years. I mean, it was it was unbelievably big. And there's a great image of me, I think I can fish it out, I'll put it on Twitter later on, of me running onto the pitch and rugby tackling Patrick McBerty on, in, on the Clonus pitch because I, I was the perfect age for this to happen. It was the culmination of of an unbelievable Donegal team. They won their first title. It was brilliant. I never thought that moment would come. And then 2012, they build on that again and win the All-Ireland final. I was told to calm down by a fellow Donegal person in the hill when Michael Murphy stuck the ball into the net. That's how big a moment that was. And for a certain generation, yes, the 92 team, Brian McIniff, Martin McHugh, they are the players that you will look up to. But this 2012 team, they're the exact same for my generation. So that's yeah, why Jim would get it. But you have to say, it's, it's, Hendrick, that they got it, you know, Michael Murphy will talk, they will all talk about the inspiration they took from 92. And you have to go back, Donegal had never been in the Ireland final before 92. You know, that was the big groundbreaking one, as was 72 winning Ulster. The, obviously, it's huge what happened in the past decade for people of your generation, but it was unthinkable. Like, up till the late 80s, Donegal had never been higher in the league than Division Three. They were always a Division Three or Division Four team, so that that was over 100, the, uh, the first hundred years of GA's history. The GA, Donegal was seen as akin to a Carlo or a Longcourt for much of their history. I, you know, I, so let's, let's, you can't, you can't, and also you can't it's important to say as well that obviously this is this is Donegal's Mount Rushmore and the, and the responsibility is with you to bear the weight of your county, not just your own experience. Don't fall down that Nathan Murphy trap of uh, not including somebody who really should be on your county's Mount Rushmore. So it's the weight of your county, not just your own experience. You need to bear that in mind as we uh, work our way through here and you can give it some consideration. We'll, we will get your final four from you before we wrap up. But let's move on from this particular element of the conversation now to your third pick for Donegal's Mount Rushmore. Right. Number three, Shea Given. He definitely deserved to be here. He played at an unbelievably high standard, first of all. He played at a couple of major tournaments for Ireland. He was he had a brilliant impact as well as a player. Like it wasn't as if he was just uh, another player in that Newcastle team. He won he won multiple uh, individual honours when he was playing for Newcastle and he's held to a very, very high esteem in Donegal as well. So Shea Given is my number three pick. Uh, I think he's an automatic selection in this team, hands down. Um, I know, again, we're looking at a generational thing. Packy Boner will definitely be someone who, from a certain age point, means the world to them because it's the biggest sporting moment, probably one of the biggest sporting moments in Irish football history. But for me, Shea Given is absolutely a dead cert on this Mount Rushmore for Donegal. He's probably one of the probably played at the highest standard of any Donegal sports person when we're talking relative sports. So football, if you're talking about a footballer, nobody played at a higher standard than Shea Given. So that means Packy Bonner, Packy Bonner doesn't make the cut, right? I didn't say that. What have you got for us, Enda? Come on. Right. So number four is a tough one. This is a tough one. This is where I changed my mind a couple of times because my original list, I said, Packy Boner straight away. That was my first choice. And then I changed my mind. I was like, oh, what about the mistakes that he made in USA in 84, you know? But Packy Boner has to be there. He can't not be there. So I'm going with two, two goalkeepers. I'll go with both of them. Shea Given, Packy Boner, they're my last two selections on the list. Karen, He bottled it, didn't he? What do you think? Carl Ender, he bottled it. Didn't want it. There's too much. <laughs> didn't want to fall out with anybody. So. No, well, well, I'll just explain the Parky one for, because it's, been, it's amazing the amount of debate about it, and, and it really a lot of it is depend, depend on, on your generation. But I think you have to go back further. You have to look at the character of the county. And if you're talking about Mount Rushmore and what the, what the county represents and what these people would represent to the county, 
Uh, Donegal is a very distinctive county for many reasons. One of the reasons is for a rural county, like outside of the counties with the, with the big city, soccer is generally isn't that strong. But soccer is a really strong tradition in Donegal. And it goes back to the kind of, uh, patterns of migration with Scotland. But generally, Donegal people live to Glasgow rather than to Dublin or to Belfast. Like they were as familiar with Glasgow as they would have been with Dublin, more familiar. I've gone back, uh, Patrick McGill, who would be known from the McGill Summer School, he wrote a book called Children of the Dead End. And it's about uh, those uh, labourers who went over to Scotland for tapey hokers, they were calling called. It was for the potato harvest. And it was effectively slave labour. They, they were paid very little. They stayed in these camps in pretty brutal conditions. And a lot of those people put down roots there. Like the seven, Glas seven Glasgow-born footballers have played international football for Ireland. All seven have Donegal roots. You know, that's how strong the connection is. And rooted in that is the connection with Celtic Football Club. The, the first thought laid on the parkhead pitch was taken over in a ferry from West Donegal, because that's how strong the, those links were. So when you talk about Donegal people's pride in having the Ireland goalkeeper and Paddy Bonner, there was also a huge amount of pride in having the Celtic goalkeeper. That was massive in Donegal. The Celtic have always been huge there. And he played in an era when Celtic were very strong and when the Scottish League was very strong. Aberdeen and Dun went to European Cup Winners' Cup final during that era and beat Real Madrid in the final. Dundee United went to UEFA Cup final, beating Barcelona and Borussia Mönchengladbach along the way. They went to the European Cup semi-final in 84 and only lost to Rome over two legs by one goal. So it wasn't just about Celtic and Rangers then. He played over 600 times for Celtic. He is seen as a Celtic icon. So for that reason alone, if he hadn't done anything for Ireland, he would be revered in Donegal. Then when you look at Ireland, it's not just about Genoa. People just think it was just a penalty save. Ireland, the three most significant games Ireland ever played in international football were against England in 88, Romania in 1990, and uh, Italy in 1994. Goalkeeper for all three, kept clean sheets in all three. He got man of the match award against England, Ireland's first ever game in an international tournament. He saved the penalty in, in Genoa and he kept out Italy with Baggio, etc., a team who went to the, ended up in the World Cup final in 94. Of course he made mistakes. He, was, he, he, had, he, had, he, he had a bad mistake against um, Holland when Ireland were knocked out in 1994. He arguably shouldn't have been at the team for that tournament because he was in decline and Alan Kelly should have been in. But Shane Given made mistakes before as well. Like, I'm, not, I'm not sure which of them is the better keeper. I have a lot of respect for Shane Given. I think he was outstanding for a long time. The people saying he was world class. Ah, Kieran, you'd, have, you'd have to accept you'd have to accept that Che Given, if it comes to a quality conversation, having played at a superior league over a longer period of time, was in consideration for some of the I mean, top clubs. Hold on, hold on. He's, he's in a world class conversation. The never made the, this is a, no, hold on, Adrian. Manchester United. Do you know, after Schmeichel, Manchester United went through goalkeepers at a rate of knots. I think they they went through fourteen goalkeepers. Up, up until they got Edwin Van der Sar. Some of them only played a few games. The likes of Roy Carl played, um, Taibi, like a lot of really poor goalkeepers. They scouted Shea Gibbon for a long time. Both Alex Ferguson and Tony Coton, the goalkeeping coach, went to I went and watched him several times and they both agreed he's not he's not the level we need. And part yeah, of that, but they, they, I mean they, they probably made a mistake, Karen, is the thing. No, like no, you're talking about Roy yes. Carl, like he's no, no, hold yeah, on. He's clear, no, no, I want clearly to, no, a better keeper than some of those names you yeah. mentioned there. Absolutely. He's better than... Of course he is. But but they wanted somebody like Van der, uh, Van der Sar, who significantly is much taller and bigger than Shea Gibbon. And that actually went against Shea Gibbon. Because whether you believe... he's depending on what you believe, he's either 6 foot or 6 one, And he started playing in an era where the average height of Premier League keepers was 6'3". I think that went against him getting the top clubs. Like, say in the Premier League, the level he played at was miles better than what Bonner played at. I don't know if you can say that, because... In the, Newcastle United were akin to Wolves now. They could be very good in their day, but they were they were okay. They were a good enough team. They weren't great by any means. He went through a long career. and did, I'm not saying he wasn't a, a good goalkeeper. He was an outstanding goalkeeper. To me, he's probably Ireland's best goalkeeper. But I, I think he's been used as a stick to beat down Paddy Bonner, who had a really good career. He made yeah. he made a couple of mistakes, as Jay Given did, as every goalkeeper did. There's a famous clip of Dion Dublin making a fool out of Shea Given. Every goalkeeper makes mistakes. And also, I think the way both men's careers ended was poor in that USA 94, it should have been Alan Kelly instead of Paddy Boner. 
at Euro 2012, Shea Given, to me, was nowhere near fit. He hardly trained. There was a lot of talk about it around it. And Trappett only should have made the call, or Shea Given should have made the call himself. And also then, after he retired, he came out of retirement at a time he wasn't playing club football, and he was put back in the Ireland team. And I thought that left a sour taste. Overall, mm. he's in huge credit. But he was consistent. There's a big difference in he was very, very consistent. But he doesn't have those wild games that you can think about immediately with Paddy Bonner, like the England game, like what he did against Romania. And I think Paddy Bonner, because he sums up that link between the west of Scotland and Donegal, has to be on the, the, this. Jake Evan is a very strong claim as well. But I think um, we we'll come to this in a minute. I think the Donegal sporting tradition is so broad. I'm reluctant of two people. Like you, you end up with just GA and soccer the way we're going. Yeah. And I think that would be wrong. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, look, hold that thought for a second, Kevin. We're going to come back to you in a minute. And uh, so far, with Michael Murphy, with Jim McGuinness, with Shea Given, and with Packet Bonner, which looks like uh, end of final four. But uh, time for a new element on the OTB Mount Rushmore, we're adding it to the mix. Uh, it's the last pitch, the last play. And there's a lot on the line here for the county of Donegal. Tommy Martin, another proud son of the county of Virgin Media Sport, has weighed in with his own thoughts. Hello, Tommy Martin here, throwing my tuppence worth in for the great Donegal sporting Mount Rushmore debate. First of all, could I ask that this particular Mount Rushmore be supersized somewhat? For how can our great sporting heritage as a county be narrowed down to just four iconic figures? Failing that, allow me to make the case for a man about whose inclusion I thought there would be absolutely no doubt. Alas, I have noted in recent days an element of Packy Boner revisionism creeping into the discussion, which I would like to ruthlessly crush right here. Sure, Shea Given was technically a better goalkeeper, and Packy made mistakes in World Cup games against Italy in 1990 and against the Netherlands in 1994. Firstly, though, only the 1991 should be held against him. The mistake against the Dutch in 94 had little bearing on the ultimate result, in my view. Holding it against Paki would be like questioning the legacy of Julius Caesar because the Roman Empire eventually fell. The fact that Paki was responsible for the greatest moment in the history of Irish sport should guarantee his inclusion in this particular pantheon without a doubt. The penalty save against Romania, a nation holding its breath, that grey goalkeeper jersey with the shiny flex, the must-have fashion item for kids that summer, a homecoming for our Ross's hero. I remember shaking the giant hand that sent a nation into ecstasy. But this is not a personal reflection. This is a tribute to a man who helped give us some of our greatest days as a nation. His best game for Ireland, that miraculous afternoon in 88 when he denied Lineker, Hoddle, Beardsley and the rest. Without Packy, there would be no Joxer goes to Stuttgart. Would the greatest adventure of Irish sporting history have been stopped in its tracks? Packy was, and I say this only slightly flippantly, Ireland's main playma playmaker back then. Two of our most important goals, Sheedy against England and Quinn against the Dutch, began with intercontinental ballistic kickouts from Packy. Most importantly, there is the fact that some legacies are above revisionism, some achievements too shining too joyful, too glorious to be subjected to the nitpicking deconstruction of us mere mortals. The Charlton years are among those, and Packy was one of the leading men. For what it's worth, my Donegal Rushmore is Packy, Brian McIniff, Michael Murphy, and um, one of these two. I can't decide, but thankfully, I don't have to. I don't envy you, chaps. Enjoy. Lovely stuff. Lovely stuff there from uh, Tommy Martin of Virgin Media Sport uh, with his picks of who he thinks should be up there. So to recap, end is four and uh, where we're at, Michael Murphy, Jim McGuinness, Shea Gavin and Packy Boner are uh, end is picks for the four that should be on the Donegal. Mount Rushmore, uh, Kieran, we're going to get to your one change in just a minute. But before that, any other names that are worthy of mentioning in the mixer? Myself, Adrian. For Kieran, yeah. Okay, oh, well, there's Tom's... Um, like there's a few I'll run through them quick, as quick as I can Adrian like Dave Gallagher was the main uh, he's the legendary All Blacks captain and basically created he's given a lot of credit for creating the All Blacks myth and creating everything that the All Blacks eventually became and Patsy Gallagher was a Celtic great in the first part of the 20th century he's still regarded as one of the all time best players the caveat I would make with both of them both of them emigrated when they were three, four years old 
So you could say they're products of Scot- uh, Scotland or New Zealand as much as Donegal. So for that reason, I, I would leave them out. Patsy McGon, uh, there's a very strong athletics tradition and Olympic tradition in Donegal. And Patsy McGonagall has a lot, a lot to do with that, uh, what he'd done with Finn Valley. And he ended up being manager of Ireland teams at Olympics. Danny McDade, who was a two-time Olympian uh, in the marathon, had a lot to do with it. And, uh, you know, there's tons of others, like, the, you know, League of Ireland, uh, Patsy McGowan winning the, uh, winning the FEI Cup with Finn Harps. Like, Kevin McHugh, what he's done with his goal-scoring exploits in recent years. Uh, there's a great rallying tradition. You can throw in quite a few names from rallying tradition. Only one Irish woman has gone to four Olympic Games. Chloe McGee has gone to three in badminton. And that, she's a well placed to go to f- a fourth in Tokyo. Somebody like Chloe shouldn't be forgotten either. To me, the, the one outstanding one that we haven't mentioned and that I will be putting on and taking out one of Enda's choices is Sinead Jennings or Sinead Lynch as she's now known so she, she's married to Sam Lynch because Sinead there's, an, there's only one world champion from Donegal I'm open to correction that but as far as I know that, that's the case Sinead Jennings was a world champion in rowing but it, her career wasn't just about rowing she was an, uh, she represented Ireland in triathlon in cycling and she came very close to going to the 2012 Olympics in track cycling. And she was very unlucky in that she won her world title in rowing in 2001, but it wasn't in an Olympic class boat. So she wanted to go in the doubles boat. But Irish rowing could never find a partner that was as good as her. So she kind of missed, she missed out in 04 and 08 because of that. Like she was always good enough, but she, 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 they couldn't get a good enough partner. She got one in 2016 in Clare Lamb and eventually went to the Olympics. And they ended up going to the Olympic rowing final. They finished sixth at the Olympics. And Sinead Jennings at the time was a couple of months short of her 40th birthday. She had three kids and she's a doctor. She's a GP. To do that at that age and after all she'd gone through was incredible. Better still, she came home from Tokyo. The Olympics finished this Sunday. She came home on the Monday or the Tuesday. They had a reception for the Wednesday. The following again, the Donegal Half Marathon Championships was on. A, run, a, a road race. She won it. Like if you, you have to... World champions in any sport have to be respected. Because they're That's so rare enough, yeah. and the history very sport. To me, she has That's to be on there. She has D- to be there. There's been... There's been a couple of omissions from that haven't been mentioned, and we should mention them before we um, look to wrap up. Ender, with your final thoughts, to give us your firm final four. Uh, Nora Stapleton, I think one of those 50 Ireland caps, three World Cups, won two Six Nations, a trophy winner as well at national level in both uh, soccer and Gaelic football. Definitely worth mentioning this conversation. And Seamus Coleman, lad, does not even come up for conversation yet. And you I better nail on your... What's Listen, that? Seamus Coleman for me. Uh, in a few years' time, we might discuss this list, and he could be there because he'll have. Oh, that's the ultimate cop the out, Andrew. That's what everybody's using as a cop uh, out. He'll have played at the highest level of Premier League, and in my opinion, Seamus Coleman probably played for longer at a higher level than Shea Given did in the Premier League. So he's definitely in, in consideration. But I just think that Shea, uh, Shea Given is he's so many Ireland caps. He was uh, the main keeper for Ireland for so long that he, for now, anyway, he trumps Seamus Coleman uh, in, in terms of getting into the team. I, I do want to mention a couple of more names that we haven't got to as well. Uh, Geraldine McLaughlin is someone that uh, maybe people outside of Donegal don't really know that well. She's been probably the most dominant female athlete in Donegal in terms of a GAA sense uh, for so many years now. She uh, Her team, Terman, won the All-Ireland Club final last year. They scored 3-11 in the final. She got 3-8 of that. She is an unbelievable player. I think you might, have, might remember Joe Brawley actually name-checked her as one of the best footballers in Ireland. Uh, she's in, an incredible, incredible player. Uh, Brendan Boyce, uh, an Olympic, uh, an Olympian as well in walking. Uh, I think someone that we do have to mention is Manus Kelly. Um, he passed away last year when he was killed in a car crash when he was uh, uh, driving in the Donegal rally. And um, he had won that rally three times in a row. And just to put into context, I know many people might not be familiar with how big that is. The Donegal International Rally is, it, it attracts the best drivers in the world. Colin McRae drove in it, uh, Sebastian Loeb won it. So it's not as if he's just driving against local drivers. He's driving against world-class drivers. He won it three times in a row. Uh, and he, he also did a lot for GAA around Donegal as well. So he, 
he, he's definitely worth mentioning uh, in this list. Danny McDade, uh, Kieran already mentioned. Um, Mark English is someone who in a couple of years' time, who knows, he might actually be an Olympic medalist. So he'll definitely go onto the list if that is the case. But he's he's worth mentioning as well. Uh, other, otherwise, Jason Quigley, another world medalist, sil- silver medal, or world champion, championship uh, boxer. Doesn't really You don't really get a lot of boxers in Donegal. Mm-hmm. So he's fighting at a massive level. And if he goes on to be a world champion, he's definitely worth considering as well. And uh, outside of that, uh, outside of probably the t- partaking in sport, uh, Ricky Sims is probably worth mentioning as well. He's been the uh, agent behind Usain Bolt and some of the best uh, runners in the world as well. So he's uh, he's a Mulford man, I believe. So uh, he's definitely worth considering right. as part Come of. Come on, if we're under into agents, and we gotta we gotta wrap this up. Give us your who are the four people that you are deciding to put on the Donegal Mount Rushmore? Have you been swayed? Right, I'm, I'm going to stick with my list. I'm going to go with Michael Murphy. Jim McGuinness, Shea Given, and Packy Boner. Karen Cunningham, you have now the opportunity to swap out one of those. Who are yeah, you taking Sinead, out? Sinead Lynch is um, shouldering Jim McGuinness off the stage. <laughs> Sinead Lynch for Jim McGuinness. A good way to a good way to end it, lads. Absolute pleasure. Fair play. Case is well made. Cheers. Thanks a million this morning again to call of off the ball and Karen Cunningham of the Irish Daily Star. That is the. Uh, that is the end of the Donegal Mount Rushmore. The debate rages on, but that's it for Donegal for the minute.